Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I B. DeGangi doing political commentary for the Media Speaks. Uh, low deaf people, don't laugh at me. I'm trying to get two cameras synced at one time. Also, for those of you familiar with the Buddy Puff character, I am not doing the Buddy Puff character, even though I have the sunglasses on. You see this? This is what happens when you do not change your contact lens solution. Christelle is like the freaking Easter Bunny. You can never find contact lens solution anywhere you go. So you use the same contact lens solution and you end up looking like your eye came out of a horror movie about ancient Egypt. So I'm wearing sunglasses so that you guys won't stare at my bright red eye, okay? Uh, Infowars.com. Senior police officers suggest companies allowing people to use strong crypto are friendly towards terrorists. Now, how many of you think maybe a, a politician, for instance, he may, may not, but may send out sexts? Do you think it's possible, even if he's just sending them out to his wife? I'm not implying that he's uh, Bill Clinton. Or I, I, I don't mean Bill Clinton. I mean cheater. Um, no, no, I guess I do mean Bill Clinton. I'm not implying that he's Bill Clinton. Or rather, I'm simply saying that there are things that you send that you do not want anyone, that it be anyone, even the NSA, getting. Well, this is Glenn Moody. I said it was InfoWars. It's actually original, originated here from Tech Dirt. Last November, where we ran through a list of senior law enforcement officers on both sides of the Atlantic, who all came out with suspiciously similar wines, and there's a link, and believe me, I know a wine when I hear it, about how strong crypto was turning the internet into a, quote, dark and ungoverned, end quote, place. Thank God. Judging by this story in Reuters, others want to join in the choir, and there's many links throughout this article proving its authenticity. Some technology and communication firms are helping militants avoid detection by developing systems that are friendly to terrorists, Britain's top anti-terrorism police officer said on Tuesday. That remark comes from Assistant Commissioner Mark Rowley, who is UK's national policy lead for counterterrorism, replacing Cassandra Dick. And here's the problem, according to Rowley. Some of the acceleration of technology, whether it's communications or other spheres, can be set up in different ways, Rowley told a conference in London. It can be set up in a way which is friendly to terrorists and helps them and creates challenges for law enforcement and intelligence agencies. Or it can be set up in a way which doesn't do that. In other words, unknown number of people should be allowed to send and excuse me, read every text that is sent to make sure you're not a terrorist. And if you're not a terrorist, they simply get rid of them. They don't share them with friends. They don't store them on servers that can be hacked. So let's say you're a uh, libertarian politician and um, somebody sends you an email reminding you about how you used to smoke marijuana many, many years ago. Because you were friendly towards law enforcement, they got that text or that email and they didn't do anything with it the law enforcement was honest okay but enemies of that candidate went on to a server and got that information and there are people that sell stolen um uh, email information all the time that's why hackers in fact uh, one of the reasons that i should say that hackers do it to a large degree so now this information can be blackmailed. Now your politician can be bought. This could happen with sexting. This could happen with affairs. This could happen with gambling. This could happen with drugs. This could happen because of fundraising issues. This could happen because of anything. And you know the politician isn't going to say, oh, I just you know, didn't raise funds correctly, so I'm going to bow out. No. 
they're going to go ahead and let themselves be blackmailed. And now they are owned by the people that have that email, that have purchased or otherwise acquired that email, gotten that text. Are you seeing why this has nothing to do with terrorism when you really look at the grand scope of it all? A setup in a way which is friendly to terrorists and helps them obviously means using strong crypto set up in a way which doesn't do that, therefore means with compromised crypto. Like his colleagues, Rowley too blames the current mistrust between the intelligence agencies and computer companies on Edward Snowden, it says. Snowden has created an environment where some technology companies are less comfortable working with law enforcement and intelligence agencies, and the bad guys are better informed, Raleigh told Reuters after his speech. Yeah, never mind that you just want what you write to be, uh, you know, read by you and the person it was sent to only. Well, no, actually, that environment, it says, has been created by the NSA, not by Snowden. He didn't do it and GCHQ working together to break into the main online services and undermine key aspects of digital technology with no thought for the collateral damage that running internet security might cause for the world. Rowley is quoted as saying, quote, we all love the benefit of the internet and all the rest of it, but we need technology companies support in making sure that they're doing everything possible to stop their technology being exploited by terrorists. I'm saying that needs to be front and center, and they're thinking, and for some of it, it is, some of it isn't. The technology is quite being exploited by terrorists. It's being used by them just as the telephone is, or microwaves, or washing machines. That's what those devices are there for. The idea that trying to make broken internet technology should be front and center of technology companies thinking bespeaks a complete contempt for the users. In other words, they don't care whether or not your privacy and your rights are intact as long as they can spy on everything you do under the unlikelihood that they're going to find a terrorist. It says, uh, last paragraph, this constant refrain about how awful strong crypto is and how we must not break it is simply the intelligence services implicitly admitting that they find the idea of doing their job in a free society where people are able to keep some messages private too hard, so they should be really grateful if technology companies would just fall in line and make life easier by destroying privacy for everyone else. And friends, that's true. Please remember that these encryption things do not hurt law enforcement in any way, shape, matter, or form. The police may get a warrant any time that they wish, and all of those things will become known. You do not need to spy on everybody who does not have a warrant to get this done. Um, this is Alternet.org. The anti-surveillance state clothes and gadgets block face recognition technology and they confuse drones and make you digitally invisible. This is wonderful news. This is like the best fashion news I've ever heard. This is by Janet Burns. Last spring, designer Adam Harvey hosted a session on hair and makeup techniques for attendees of the 2015 Future Everything Festival in Manchester, England. Rather than sharing innovative ways to bring out the audience's eyes, Harvey's CV Dazzle Anon introduced a series of styling methods. Get this designed with almost the exact opposite aim of traditional beauty tricks, to turn your face into an anti-face, one that cameras, particularly those on the, of the surveillance variety, <clears throat> will not only fail to love, but fail to recognize. In other words, your anonymity is coming back thanks to this wonderful creation. Harvey is one of a growing number of privacy-focused designers and developers exploring new opportunities that are the result of heightened surveillance and working to establish lines of defense against it. He spent the past several years experimenting with strategies for putting control over people's privacy back in their own hands and in their pockets and, in their fa and on their faces. Harvey's goal of creating a style that is functional and aesthetic has driven several projects and collaborations, including a method of, quote, spoofing DNA, 
That's wonderful news, keeping your DNA private by messing up the DNA they get from you. And via the Privacy Gift Shop, links to all of this on Altnet. His drone thwarting stealthware line, that's clothes that he claims shields them against thermal imaging, which is used widely by military drones to target people. In other words, they can't see you. And the off-pocket phone sleeve, which is able to keep out unwanted wireless signals they cannot find you based on your cell phone location. Although maybe if you still call, so be careful. His CZ Dazzle designs for hair and makeup obscure the eyes, bridge of the nose, and the shape of the head, as well as creating skin tone contrasts and asymmetries. Facial recognition algorithms function by identifying the layout of facial features and supplying missing info based on assumed facial symmetry. Therefore, the project demonstrates that a styled anti-face, as they call it, can both conceal a person's identity from facial recognition software, be it the FBI's or Facebook's, and cause the software to doubt the presence of a human face, period. In other words, they won't even be able to read it as a face. Look this guy up. Support him. That's why I'm reporting on it, friends. Harvey's work is focused on accessibility in addition to privacy. Most of the projects I've worked on are analog solutions to digital challenges, he said. His hair and makeup style tips, a veritable how-to guide for how to create privacy reclaiming looks at home, are deliberately low cost. His current project, software to automatically generate camouflage that can be applied to faces, will allow a user to create their own look and guide the design towards their own personal style preferences, all the while getting their privacy back because the drones and the facial recognition programs just can't seem to read them now, can they? Other low-tech protections against widespread surveillance have been gaining ground too. Though initially designed as a tongue-in-cheek solution to prying eyes and cameras, Becky Stern's laptop computer body sock offers a compatible peak-free zone for laptop users, that's good news, while the CHBL jammer coat, which you can look up in the altnet.org article, and sold-out phone kerchief, Use metal infused fabrics to make personal gadgets unreachable, blocking text calls and radio waves. Thank you, screw off police, who are looking at my emails for no reason. For people willing to sport a bit more hardware in the name of privacy, the Sentinel City Survival Kit offers underwear, no figure, that, no, that notifies wearers about real life fishing and tracking attempts. And its LED umbrella, which lets users flirt with object tracking algorithms used in advanced surveillance system, and even train these systems to recognize non-human shapes. It says large companies are also getting in on the pushback against increasing surveillance. Earlier this year, antivirus software leaders AVG, which always works, revealed a pair of invisibility glasses developed by its Innovation Labs division. It says the casual looking specs use embedded infrared lights to create noise around the nose and eyes, and retro reflective frame coating to interfere with camera flashes, allowing the wearer to avoid facial recognition. This is by AVG. It's called invisibility glasses. In other words, just wearing these glasses, you can't tell it's doing it, but it's throwing off facial recognition programs even though your eye can't pick up the spectrum. In 2013, Japan's National Institute of Informatics revealed a bulky pair of Googles, goggles that it had developed for the same purpose. A spokesperson for Innovation Labs, it goes on, claims its glasses represent an important step in the prevention against mass surveillance whether through the cell phone camera or a passerby, a CCTV camera even in a bar, or a drone flying over your head in the street. 
Innervation Lab says that a person's picture facial recognition software coupled with data from social networking sites can provide instant access to the private information of complete strangers. This can pose a serious threat to our privacy. Where are the feminists worried about rape when something like this happens? Though AVG's glasses are not scheduled for commercial release, Innovation Labs said that individuals can take a number of steps to prevent their images from being harvested. First and foremost, make sure that you're not allowing private corporations to create biometric profiles about you. When using social networks like Facebook, be aware that they are using facial recognition to give you tag suggestions. Facebook's deep face was already tested and trained on the largest facial database to date and identify a labeled database of more than 4 million facial images belonging, belonging to thousands of identities. Holmes Wilson, it says, of nonprofit Fight for Future, which works to defend online privacy and freedoms on various fronts, is more concerned with other types of privacy invasion than real-life image harvesting. It's pretty unlikely in most of the world that you will be followed around using a network of street cameras with facial recognition. It's probably pretty likely, though, that you'll get filmed by police at a protest, but there's not much you can do about that other than wearing a mask. Well, I told you about the hoodies earlier. Uh, Wilson advises people concerned about privacy breaches through surveillance to first focus on ways in which their gadgets are supplying info to third parties. We've explained how the anti-phone sleeve could prevent this, but we'll go on. The place where it's easiest to fight back against surveillance is in protecting the security of your messages. He said, adding that message security can be a problem for activists too. He said apps like Text Secure, Signal, and Red Phone can make it a lot harder for people to spy on you. That's good news, Wilson added. So Text Secure, Signal, and Red Phone. Phones are the biggest thing. Lots of people think of smartphones as a big privacy problem, but old-fashioned phones are just as bad and worse in some ways. All cell phones report on your location to the network as you move around, and that's how they work. And they need to send that information or the system won't know where to send the call. There's no way to turn that off other than by turning off the phone and for good measure taking the battery out. Always remember to do that. In collaboration with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Fight for, Secure, Fight for the Future recommends a variety of options for encrypting messages, password protecting accounts, and securing a user's various communication and browsing activities via, quote, reset the net. Look that up. Wilson encouraged those with specific privacy concerns to check out tutorials, resources, and breakdowns of privacy issues from surveillance self-defense so look that up on the link here so friends there you go there's some heads up some hoodie wearing activities that could actually prevent you from being uh, stalked by the government so to speak or at least the authorities and uh, i hope you've enjoyed the uh, little fourth amendment update we have here as if you would need a reason not to vote for Jeb Bush, I wouldn't even think I would need to address it, but I keep hearing his name come up as somebody that uh, people would actually vote for. TheHill.com, Jeb Bush praises Obama over NSA spying. In other words, he's already starting. A vote for him is a vote for everything going exactly the way Obama has it going for with the NSA. So th there's your first step towards there's no difference here between him and the coming Hillary. Jeb Bush, a likely presidential contender, if, oh my God, please no, said Tuesday that President Obama's greatest accomplishment was keeping in place controversial spying programs at the National Security Agency. That's right. According to Jeb Bush, the best thing Obama did was destroy the Fourth Amendment. I would say the best part of the Obama administration would be his continuance of the protections of the homeland using the big metadata programs, Bush said in an interview on the Michael Medved show. Bush argued that the NSA programs had been enhanced under Obama, even if the president never defends them or openly admits it. Yeah, in other words, becoming more totalitarian is his best accomplishment in the name of freedom. 
And they want to know why the only uh, Republican I'll even look at right now is Justin Amish or Rand Paul, and Justin Amish isn't running. The former Florida governor said the NSA's bulk collection of Americans' phone data was an important service carried out in a way that protects individual civil, liber civil liberties. He lauded the Obama administration for refusing to buckle under pressure from Democrats, civil liberties groups, and some Republicans here at 420. He has not abandoned them, Bush said. Well, there you go. That's another reason not to vote for a Democrat or Jeb Bush. Critics of the NSA program say they're a massive affront to individual privacy, while defenders say they're a critical tool in uncovering and combating terrorism. That's because the second is wrong and the first is right. The issue has revealed an early split among some Republican presidential contenders. Senator Rand Paul, who has long been a critic of the programs, and thankfully so, sued the Obama administration last year over the bulk collection of phone records. Senator Ted Cruz co-sponsored legislation that would have dramatically scaled back the program by requiring the spy agency to get a court order before obtaining records from private phone companies. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Bush on Tuesday also took a swipe at the president, saying his other great accomplishment was delivering two of the biggest wave elections since the 1920s to Republicans. Turning his fire on Hillary Clinton, who won't be any different, is running for Democratic presidential nomination. Bush said the former Secretary of Hate's early campaign appearances looked contrived. Well, since she hasn't answered any question about her running platform, I would agree. She's in the Scooby-Doo van, as if we really care. Um, friends, I want to get on to Rubio, as we're doing people that are running for president here. This is from apnnews.myway.com. Rubio tells donors he is running for the White House. Well, Rubio is almost as bad as Jeb Bush. So that's like saying, yay, Jeb Bush and Jeb Bush's clone, almost is running for president. Senator Marco Rubio on a Monday he took on Hillary Rodham Clinton in the first words as presidential candidate telling top donors he is running for the Republican nomination because of the 2016 race for the White House should be about the future, not the past. I agree with him on that. I just think he'd be an awful future. The first term Republican from Florida, who is 43, how do you do all that by 43, uh, also told his most generous backers that he feels uniquely qualified to pitch his Republican Party as one that will defend the American dream. I'm 42, you'd be better off voting for me. I'd do a better job. Yes, I believe it. Rubio spoke on a conference call with donors before a flashy political rally set for Monday night in Miami. In previewing his campaign central message, Rubio said the dream is slipping away from too many families' grip. Yeah, partly because of Republicans. And young Americans face unequal opportunities to succeed. I'm 42. I've never seen an opportunity, so don't give me that. It was a message honed to pitch the GOP as a party that cares about all voters, not just those in the upper tax brackets. Yeah, because there's fewer and fewer of them, largely in part to Democratic and Republican policies. I uniquely feel qualified to not just make an argument, but to con outline the policies that we need to have in order to achieve it, he said. A young man in a hurry, Rubio will no doubt hear rivals tell voters he's not ready for the White House. To counter that, Rubio has outlined specific policy proposals, which is more than his Hillary has done that boost him as a policy expert both in foreign and domestic issues. On Tuesday, the first day of an official candidate, he is set to return to Washington to join a Senate hearing on a proposed deal with Iran on its nuclear ambitions. Rubio's presidential announcement comes the day after Clinton announced her bid for the Democratic nomination as she is traveling to Iowa on her first trip as a candidate. It says the Republican Party for some time and a long time has a chance in this election to be the party of the future, Rubio, Rubio told donors. Well, not hopefully with him and Jeb. Hopefully uh, either Amish or Rand. Amish, please run. Just yesterday, we heard from a leader from yesterday who wants to take us back to yesterday. But I feel that this country has always been about tomorrow. Rubio 
if you are contemplating even briefly giving Iran a nuclear bomb, then you're already proving you're part of the problem. But they're not going to get a bomb. Friends, right now the only Republican that's even on the radar as a possibility is Rand Paul. Friends, this show is brought to you by people like Angela, who donate to the show at uh, thecorrectviews at hotmail.com. Get a hold of me and I'll tell you how to donate. We are working on getting graphics back up here. Might replace the Boba Fett. But we'll have graphics back up again, largely because of her. We are in the process of ordering parts to make that happen. It's also brought to you by Sticker Junkie, who made these stickers. There's our first movie. These are, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash uh, Sam from Passing Time. Go to, get a hold of me anywhere. Leave a comment. These are Passing Time stickers. It's my band. And fortunately, they look amazing thanks to Sticker Junkie. So go to StickerJunkie.com, and when you order, make sure you leave a comment that says, I heard about it on the correct views. You'll get a discount if you do that, friends. All right, guys, moving on. This is uh, Smart Meters Enforcement of Mandatory Water Restrictions is only just the beginning. Brought to you by Mike McLaughlin. Do you read fiction? I hope that you do. And if you do, you're going to want to look up Mike McLaughlin on Facebook. You can also look him up uh, for political rants and poetry. He's really branched out, so please, M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N, Mike McLaughlin. This article here on smart meters from Michael Snyder at the economic collapse. Now, I've gotten a smart meter. It was forced upon me in Canton, Ohio. If anybody knows how I can sue for this, please let me know, because I have hardly gotten a good night's sleep since. These things are radioactive nightmares. They release a far more radiation than the test that says that they do every time somebody private tests them. And that includes scientists. And now they're being used to spy on how much water you use. I'm, I'm dead serious. There's no other way to put it. Smart meters are now being used by authorities to crack down on water wasters in the state of California, but this is just a tip of the iceberg as far as what they can be used for. Ultimately, smart meters are designed to be part of an entire smart grid that will enable government bureaucrats to control everything from your dishwater to your dishwasher to your thermostat. And in recent years, there has been a massive push to install smart meters in as many homes in the United States and Europe as possible. They were forced upon me, and I do believe that they are a cancer risk. Back in, and that can be proven. It's not a belief. It's the correct view. Back in December of 07, there were only 7 million smart meters installed in this country. Today, there are more than 51 million, poisoning you, giving you cancer. On the other side of the Atlantic, the European Parliament has set a goal of having smart meters in 80% of all homes by the year 2020 in order to give you cancer and kill you off like the Georgia Guidestones want. Look it up. This is being promoted as the green thing to do, but could it be possible that there is more to these smart meters than meets the eye? In Long Beach, California, Authorities are getting complaints that a local McDonald's restaurant was wasting water in the middle of the night. So what did authorities do? They installed a smart meter, which constantly started providing incriminating evidence against McDonald's. Well, isn't that illegal? This is from CBS. The Long Beach Water Department says sprinklers at a McDonald's restaurant on Bellflower Boulevard. So if you're anywhere near that McDonald's, make sure you eat a cheeseburger just to support them uh, fighting the city. When for 45 minutes at a time, twice a night, for an undefined number of nights, complaints continued to mount as water pooled and washed. The department, however, could do little to what the wasting. That was before the smart meter, which is giving their employees cancer. Since its installation in February, Long Beach Water Department General Manager Kevin Wadier says it saw the imminent spike of tens of thousands of gallons each time McDonald's overwatered their property. And according to NPR, uh, other large California cities are also now looking at how they can use smart meters to enforce the new mandatory water restrictions. So now you've got exactly the spying that we always said you would have with smart meters, and everybody said that we were nuts. And this is exactly why I ral rallied against uh, crazy Jerry Brown getting more entrenched in politics in that state because he's been doing horrible. 
It says already police all over the country are using the data provided by smart meters to identify homes that are potentially growing marijuana so they can lock more people up, so they can make more money for the state from people that aren't bothering anyone. Homes that grow marijuana tend to use more electricity than other homes, so if your home is using a high level of energy, that red flags you for the cops. Oh, but they'd never spy on you. What's worse is what it's doing to your health, and there are links to prove that this is not my imagination, but it is, in fact, the correct view. According to physician and epidemiologist Sam Millaham, smart meters, which are linked to an array of health issues, emit 100 times the amount of radiation of a cell phone. Daniel Hirsch, a senior lecturer on nuclear policy at UCSC, says the federal government purposefully misleads the public by conducting bias safety studies at the behest of power companies. In other words, they lie. A Washington, D.C. power company stirred controversy in 2013 after they were caught lying to the public about how often their smart meters emitted radiation. Despite claims that the meters only emitted radiation once every four to six hours, an investigation by WUSA 9 News revealed the frequency to be closer to four to six times every minute. In other words, all of this leads to the deterioration of your health. It says when there is that much radiation blasting through our homes on a continual basis, it is inevitable that there are going to be health problems. According to InfoWars, tens of thousands of people have already reported significant health issues that they believe are directly related to the installation of smart meters into their homes. Again, it's, it's destroying my sleep, I can tell you, because your eyes don't, your eyes read the infrared that it's sending out even if you, uh, even if you're shut off. And don't give me this BS about your wireless, because this emits more radiation more often in stronger intervals. Tens of thousands of individuals are reporting officially to governments and utilities that they are experiencing illness or functional impairments following the installation of smart meters. I would be one of them. Reported symptoms include headaches, sleep problems, that would be me, ear ringing, focus difficulties, fatigue, heart palpitations, nausea, and statistically abnormal reoccurrences of cancer. In other words, bringing back cancer in instances where they never even imagined that it would come back. So, there you go. Another thing that was completely predicted on this show and another thing that is proven to be absolutely true. You guys have the voice to get rid of these things. It all depends whether or not you've got the balls to use them. Friends, two more stories to get to. Two more dumdies because the Dunce Cap of the Month Award and the Massive Fukushima update are coming soon. But, um... As it stands here, I'm probably going to have more dumdies than I can get to in one show. So I'm going to be doing a couple a night here to uh, thin these out a little bit. EAG News. Illinois High School moves to ban birthday cakes, pizza, and donuts from Victor Skinner. It's the most important thing we have to worry about, friends. At Danville High School... Birthday cakes, cupcakes, pizza may soon go the way of chalkboards and slide rulers. The district officials have worked in recent years to implement restrictions on calories, fat, sodium, sugar, whole wheat, and other aspects of school lunches imposed on schools by Michelle Obama's Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. She looks like a linebacker. What the hell does she know about health? Now they're scrammed. It's the truth. Now they're scrambling to comply with the same restrictions that went into effect this year for other foods sold at school, like vending machine fare and treats sold at fundraisers, New York's Gazette reports. The News Gazette. Well, make sure you sneak your food uh, in, kids. You don't have to tell anybody it's in there. Big Brothers Big Sisters of Vermilion County, for example, raised $150 at Danville High School for, so far this year, selling slices of Little Caesars pizza to students after school. After. The money goes to provide field trips and activities for middle school students and high school students. Since the federal regulations outlawed all unhealthy foods at school, it is likely to be their last pizza fundraiser. Thank you, Mrs. Hitler Obama. Danville Food Service Director Greg Lazelle told the news site that he plans to present changes to the district's food policies that will eliminate unhealthy snacks that are sold in schools. 
because it's not up to the kid or the parent. Lazelle said he will also recommend taking the restrictions an unnecessary step further by banning sugary or high-calorie schools brought in by parents for special celebrations as well. So those kids sneak it in. There's ways to do it. Lazelle's proposal, which he will present to school board members Wednesday, would prohibit parents from bringing in homemade goodies like birthday cakes, cookies, and allow only store-bought pre-made treats. That's from a sanitation standpoint and a fruit allergy standpoint. If you have an allergy to peanuts, don't eat them. Congratulations, Sparky. You figured it out. A committee initially discussed a ban on all celebratory foods, but opted to recommend a gradual transition to food-free classroom parties instead. Currently, fundraisers with unhealthy snacks are limited to 36 days per school year, but Lizelle wants to reduce the number to 18 next year. Yeah, so there'll be less field trips. The point is, what a person eats is up to the person. The point is, kids, I hope you sneak your own junk food in in Illinois. Yes, I said it, and I'll stand by it. Friends, that brings us to the last, the biggest dummy of the day, the Telegraph. U.S. court to decide if Alzheimer's patient was able to consent to sex. First of all, nothing in this story implies that the man raped his Alzheimer's wife. Second of all, she's already dead. Third, and I don't mean to be mean because my grandfather, God rest his soul, was forgetful, but let's be real, she probably didn't remember it if she wasn't able to consent to it. Now, I'm not being mean. I'm just saying that there are places where we can spend our money where it may, in fact, just be a little bit better spent than bothering this man who probably just wanted to make love to his wife, who he loved very much one last time. When they married in 2007, friends were delighted that the septuagenarian couple, each of whom had been widowed, and 350 people danced the polka to celebrate at their reception. Henry Rahons, a farmer and prominent Iowa state politician, and Donna Lou Young had met while singing in a church choir and became inseparable. He's probably not a rapist. She joined